awesome. Oh, hello friends. I have a special guest today and you've probably heard of Rob Greenfield before, but if not, I guess the very super short way is to say that you have done all kinds of amazing life experiences or experiments to help bring attention to the way we live and often the way that we over consume. And you have been one of the big inspirations for our 100% project because you're doing something super similar right now. Yeah. Which is, is it like tell us about yeah. the, your current project. Yeah, so hey everyone, nice to be <laughs> here with y'all. It's raining here in Cable, <laughs> but it's a beautiful day. And I'm actually from northern Wisconsin, so that's how. <laughs> kind of how you and I got connected basically right because you're doing your thing right now in Florida and I thought you lived in Florida yeah thought I'd never meet you and then a friend of mine actually the person we're going to Nicaragua with he said or from Nicaragua that we're doing the 100% project with said Rob is coming up to Wisconsin for some reason he had read it on your blog or Social something media, yeah. yeah and so he said you should get in touch with him and and you live in Ashland, which is yeah. so bizarre. <laughs> yeah, from northern Wisconsin, currently living in Orlando, Florida, just for two years. And so the project is, for one year, I'm growing and foraging 100% of my food. So even the salt, the oil, the spices, vitamins, everything, even medicine, 100% of my medicine I'm growing or foraging. So nothing goes in this mouth unless I grew it or foraged it for the entire year. Um, with a few things have happened, I've gotten essential oil like in my mouth. <laughs> so you've had um, some accidents. But <laughs> I've kissed someone with like lipstick or lip gloss <laughs> on, on. But literally, like everything I'm consuming for the entire year, I'm going with it. And it's like a cool thing about it for me was even I thought it was just forage food. So we said, oh, we'd love to get you some wild rice. But you said you have to actually forage right. it and. I remember on one of your TED Talks, you were saying when you were doing your bike with the bamboo bike across the United States, you would, if you were going to go into a building that had, because you were very careful about electricity, that had a sliding door, you would wait until somebody was going through. Yep. And so when it was an electric door. An electric yeah, door, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you really do this, you really take it seriously, and then the beautiful thing is the rest of us can observe and I think see different ways of being because so often we just we grow up living a certain way and it's hard to even question that and when somebody's stepping out of that paradigm and doing something that can seem radically different that's that's the gift you're giving the world yeah so uh, yeah, so I do, I take things really to the extreme. But I want, one thing I want to say is I do it for periods of time. So right now I'm growing and foraging 100% of my food, just for a year. Today's day 260. I have 105 days left. After that, I'll eat at restaurants sometimes and grocery stores and things like that. During my bike ride across the country, where I was trying to bike across the country having no negative environmental impact, not using electricity from on the grid, water from on the grid. You know, that was a deep immersion in paying attention to how we use resources. So what I do is I deeply immerse in these projects for periods of manageable time. And the idea is that I do things that are really extreme, that grab people's attention. And really, it's kind of like, I want to shake people up. Because we live in a time where, where it's so easy to just be comfortable in our surroundings. Something really important that I've learned is the concept of normal. Normal is created by saying, seeing the same thing happen over and over and over and being surrounded by that same thing over and over and over. It doesn't really matter what it is, how extreme it is or how mundane it is. If you're always around that, that's your normal. So we have a normal in the United States and that normal is, um, you know, we have 5% of the world's population but we consume 25% of the world's resources. Wow. That, by definition, is not, an, is not normal. It's extreme. <laughs> so the United States is an extreme 
to side. And so what I do is I take it to the other end of the extreme to point out that extreme mm. and really put it into place. But I don't tell anybody, hey, here's what you're doing wrong. I just take it to that extreme so that people can actually see it. Shock them and then hope to inspire thought and then change. That's what I have loved about your work because it's not, you just you do not come across as as preachy and telling people, oh, you know, looking down on people. In fact, you're often saying, look, if we can progress, we can make small changes, incremental changes in our life that add up to something big over time. And that's really refreshing because, you know, everything we do on this channel and we try to only <laughs> interview people that are positive. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, I think, is really, really important in a world where there's so much negativity and just like, ah. Oh. And that doesn't inspire change, I don't think. Yeah. To be told that I just suck, as opposed to saying, hey, here's a different way. Yeah. Yeah, it's important that we know the problems because it's hard to really change unless you, generally you have to learn about the problem first. But you don't have to just keep on dwelling on that. I think right. we need to educate ourselves. And so I still have some clue what's going on politically and things like that. I mean, I don't pull myself out of that completely because I want to be, I want to understand where people are coming from and the system that they're in. But <clears throat> I don't spend all day, every day doing it because what that does is it, if you have too much of that, it brings you down. Both mentally, if you're consumed by content that's designed to dumb you down, it will dumb you down. And then also it's just, it's depressing stuff. So I think it's important that we have a balance. We have to understand the problems, most likely, but then get past the problems and focus on the solutions. Oh. Like, what, like what you're doing here. You know, solution-based thinking. Solution-based thinking, that's how I feel. Now, some people get born into this blessed life where they don't have to know the problems because they're the solution already. <laughs> but few of us are born into that world where we can just skip past the existence of problems. Most of us kind of have to know it before we can move to the solutions. So something that was really important, I think this is something you spoke about in the TED talk again, and it's something we see out here with the forest monks and we found in our own life, is that there can be this concept of, if I'm gonna simplify, then I have to make big sacrifices. Mm. And what I often hear from the forest monks is go back, you know, out of the woods, back to all the wonderful things of our culture mm. and say, oh, I miss the woods. I miss like being more present with my food. And so in a way, sometimes by simplifying, life becomes more enjoyable. Yep. And that, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, so the way that I look at it, People think they, I mean, I've given up a lot, you would say. Mm -hmm. You know, I ran a company, I made a good amount of money, I had a nice shiny car and a nice apartment, and I was very focused on material possessions, financial wealth, and sort of creating this persona based on stuff. And to go from that to now, I mean, I simplified, simplified my life down to having 111 possessions, all that fit in my backpack, you know, have vowed to live off of basically under the federal poverty threshold. Yeah. So very little money. Not because I'm simulating poverty. That's just a way that I've selected to have minimal, to live simply. So basically I've given up so much. And so a lot of people think, oh, he must be yearning. One of the most common questions is, what do you miss? Yeah, and, sure. and, and so when people... When people see you giving things up, what they assume is that you're not replacing it with something else. But when you give up intentionally, you don't create a void. You, what you've done is you've made space for other things. So the more that I've given up, the more that I've made space for what I want. So sure, I don't have you know only $2,000 to my name right now. I gave up monetary elements, but that's created the freedom to be here, to be in the woods more, to, 
to be immersing in learning about my food, to be growing my food. And the thing is, the more that I've given up money and material, possess material possessions, the more that I've filled my life with things that are truly filling, purpose, passion, wow. love, relationships, I'm like, I might have less stuff, but I'm more full than I ever, than I ever was in the past. I could, I could feel that from you, even through your videos and stuff, and then meeting you, you know, just the natural joy, like the health and vibrancy from the food you're eating, and, <laughs> and you know, sometimes you just meet people and there's just a lot of walls or something there, and they're, you can feel that things are hiding inside, and it just mm. feels like there's a, a vibrancy, and I feel like, I feel like that comes sometimes when we are living a life that's more engaged or just well, more visceral. Yeah, you brought up a really good point. That I, that's the, the big thing. One of the things I gave up is lying. And I gave up trying to be something that I wasn't. And that, honestly, by giving those things up, it allows me to just be just me. And, and that's why, I don't remember the words that you just said, but it really comes down you said something about not hiding, and I'm not. Like, I gave up hiding. I gave up secrets. And it was hard. You know, it's hard to do that. Because some things are embarrassing, and some things you don't want to admit that you did that. Mm -hmm. And the more that, and you put that out in there, and then it's a reality. When you hide it, you're able to pretend it's not a reality. So the more that I put those things out there, the more that it allows me to just truly, authentically be me. So that's always been one of the big things is seeking truth. And that means seeking truth in the bigger picture, but also seeking truth within. Mm. A big goal of mine is to not live delusionally. I often ask people, how am I delusional? What are my delusions? And so that's like one of the biggest goals in life is to not be delusional. But then the other biggest thing is not living a life that's based at all on social stigmas. So I grew up, what, 45 miles north of here. And my whole childhood, I was just embarrassed of being poor, basically. My mom supported four kids with no dads really helping, and she made about $15,000 a year. So we were pretty, you know, financially... We had help. The government helped, my aunt and grandpa. But we were low, you know, quite low income. I hid that from everybody. I had nobody come over to my oh, house. Wow. I had my mom ideally drop me off a few blocks away because we had a crappy car, all of that. And that like ruled my life, just worrying what people would think. And then in my mid twenties, that's when I really started to say, I'm not gonna live a life based on what people think. I'm not gonna look at life through the lens of what would other people think. Because I realized I was spending ultimately what would result in years of my life. Because just imagine if you spend one hour in front of the mirror every day, that adds up to over three years of your life. <laughs> just standing at, in front of the mirror, the mirror. gelling the hair. <laughs> I mean, I, I gelled the hair in spikes or in flip things, the clothes, putting on different clothes when you didn't like those ones. And when I decided that I wasn't going to look at life through other people's lenses of myself, and instead I was going to look at life through the lens of what's the most benef beneficial for the earth, my community, and myself, Oh, that God. blew everything wide open. That was the biggest thing. And if I could look back at myself as a kid and just say one, give one lesson, that would be it. And ironically, one of the funniest, most interesting things about that is I was back here in Ashland County three years ago. And I learned that the poverty level of this county is 70%, which means I was not abnormal. <laughs> You were actually I was, normal. <laughs> I was hiding from everybody the fact that I was like 70% of the people in my country. Oh my gosh. And that's what we're all doing. We're all hiding from each other, even though we're all pretty much the same, but we're all just hiding our real selves. That's so beautiful because it takes like so much energy, life energy we use in that pursuit of hiding. Mm -hmm. And what if we took that energy and used it for loving each other, for helping each other out, for reaching. So that's... Yeah. And it's funny that this is what we're talking about because we were going to talk mostly about foraging, <laughs> growing and foraging all of our food, but I think the more that you 
get into these things. It's really just about being a, it's really about finding balance as a human being. Being out in the woods and foraging is as much about the food as it is about just being a, a complete human being. And, you know, it's, it's spending time out here that, and it's just connecting to the food. Like, I just learned this one today. <laughs> oxide, oxide daisy. <laughs> just learned this, still learning a lot. <laughs> It was it's, <laughs> it's the bigger picture. Everything's about the... Mm, that one almost tasted a little smoky. <laughs> Actually, that tasted like fresh icicles. Or the, 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 the top layer of snow when it's, when it's fro thawed and then frozen again. <laughs> That's what that just tasted See, like. See, this is so... So we went around foraging. And I've just never seen anybody do it with such joy. You're just picking huge bunches of wood sorrel. <laughs> And eating them and then we had some balsam fur sap and because you always are like talking about the flavor you said it tasted like pina colada which I had never thought of before but as soon as you said that I completely tasted the pina colada so, <laughs> I don't know you can still smell it on your hands I can just still smell it just... balsam see burn. here's the thing by giving up I've given up for this year, all synthetic flavors, all of these like external stimulations. So because of that, I am so stimulated <laughs> by what's freely abundant right here. I mean, just that remnant of that smell of the balsam or balsa? Balsam. Balsam. Balsam fur. <laughs> oh, so good. Sometimes I like almost just I'm gonna cry when I smell or taste these things. Also, another thing that I really noticed is my sense of taste to my memories has never been stronger. You, a number of times out here, you were bringing back memories. Oh, was I? You kept saying, yeah, this brings back this. Ah, it does. Stronger so, than ever before. For example, the first loquat, which, you know, if you're in northern Wisconsin, you wouldn't have loquat, but they grow down in Florida. The first loquat of the season that I had in about March of this year, I went to the tree, I picked it, I put the loquat in my mouth, and instantly I was there feeling the love of my former partner who I had eaten from that same tree with last year. Oh my God. And I felt the love in my chest from oh, biting wow. that loquat. And it was like as close to as her being standing there next to me and you know you get you get that our, our taste is strongly connected but now the smells and the tastes are magnified and that's ex what the point i was saying is you give up those things but what it makes way for is something that you would never you would never picture it you would never you would never expect it if the things we get in return i feel like those treasures are way greater yeah than these little our civilization has all these little handout things that say, oh, this is gonna, you know, this TV program is gonna satisfy you, or this, or this, all these entertainments and distractions, but those actually cover up all yeah. this awesome stuff that's yep. there available to all of us. It all covers it up, and I, and I can still relate because I use things to cover up all the time. I mean, I'm looking at you. <laughs> look at you, look at me. I'm here with my long pants on, and I'm covering up like one of the most beautiful experiences that I have, and I'm not taking my jacket off because I don't feel like it right now because I'm partly weak. Um, I, like one of the greatest things is if you can just gain the strength to just let the rain fall on you. Mm. And um, so I still, I still let, like I still have imbalances like the amount of time I spend on the computer, for example. No, me too. So it's impossible it's nearly impossible to not have our vices and our convenience and our comforts. And some people would like kind of they're all or none. Like, well, what's the point in even trying? But it's you don't have to go 100% to enjoy things to just an extent that you would never be able to fathom. It's, I like that message of moderation because I'll often, I'll often see that. You've got to go 100%. And people criticizing people like what you're doing because you're not 100 100 percent and i never understood that because it's like we're all on us on a spectrum and you know you're way over here 
showing how things can be done and some people are over here yeah but that we can all learn from each other on that spectrum and so but I, that's a whole other subject like well it also how we're taught to be, yeah and, and, and it goes back to what's that bug that, that kind of squished it a little oh, bit oh that's a little i think a little shield bug or a little leaf oh, i don't know here i am <laughs> trying to be a what do you call it no, oh, I can't even think of a bug, bug. Smell that. Oh, yeah, that one has a chemical defense. What does it smell like to you? <laughs> sure, it's got some smells to it. It reminds me of a plant. I wonder if this eats a specific plant and then gets its... Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. But... Oh, yeah. Can I take a quick station break? Because... Yeah. One thing I noticed about you on your TED talk was you were out on the stage barefoot. Yep. And I, you know, I always go barefoot and I was like, is he going to come barefoot? And sure enough, totally barefoot. When did that start and how has that been? Yeah, the first time I ever really started being barefoot, I was in uh, New Zealand in 2008, so 11 years ago. And I was, I was doing a little study abroad program in college called Pacific Challenge and my uh, sort of sh leader, mentor, his name was Gary, an Australian guy from Tasmania, I believe. He uh, was walking barefoot, and we were, we were hiking some, some mountains. <laughs> and he was hiking up barefoot, and I was just, Gary, how do you do this? And if I recall, he said, you know, you, a bit at a time. And I said to myself, if Gary can do that, I can do that. <laughs> so I started to walk barefoot, and I remember I, I did about maybe a mile of it. Wow. And... <laughs> you know, on the pointy rocks and stuff. And so I just started taking my shoes off more and more. And some bigger picture things like humans existed for million, you know, 99.9999% of the human experience has been without shoes. So this idea when people say, where are your shoes? How can you be walking without shoes? Don't your feet hurt? And I say, he existed before shoes. <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. That's what I'm all about getting out of this delusion. So many things. They tell you to replace your shoes every 500 miles. Don't have to replace these every 500 miles. They last. It's the most sustainable form of footwear. The, the sole, the natural shoe is the most sustainable form of footwear. Also, just the, the other big thing for me is like people talk about grounding. That's never been a reason for me. It's, but I mean, it's, I, I believe that's a reality, but it's never been a reason. Things like, for example, when you put on shoes with arches, the saying, if you don't, if you don't use it, you lose it. When you have, like, imagine walking around with crutches, what's going to happen? Your legs are not going to function if you walk around with crutches for years, you atrophy. So when you put arch support on your arch, your arch atrophies. And so you lose your ability with these hundreds of, of muscles and ligaments and tendons. So my thing is that I believe, I simply believe that the human body works. It's not revolutionary. I simply say, these things work. It's just pretty simple stuff. Simple, but in a way, a super radical, profound message. Because we're always told the opposite, yeah, it's, you know, in sneaky ways, but we're told the opposite. It's crazy that any of this is radical. Yeah. Because it is. I'm, I, am, I am radical. In this society, there's no question that I'm radical. But that's the, the reality is, is that, it's like I was talking about with the norms. The only reason I'm radical is because this society mm. is so radicalized in the way of everything is supposed to be convenient, death is bad, it, it should not be a part of life, you should never feel pain, like all yeah. of these really ridiculously radical ideas are the only reason that these simple things that we've gotten so far away from seem radical. I love the way you verbalize that because I've, I mean that's been in my mind but I've never thought of it that way, that our culture here it's ultra radical. Ultra radical. <laughs> ultra the United radical. States is so radical. <laughs> but again, because it's normal. Except I think radical is an awesome word, so I'm not even going to call them radical. Because I love, I love being radical. I mean, 
great word. It's a great thing. As long as, of course, you're being radical for good. Some radical is not so great. Right. But then what's good and what's bad? That's a whole other thing. Oh, yeah, I know. This conversation could go in I all know. kinds of cool directions. That 25 minutes felt right. like about three. <laughs> but, wow, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing, too, because it's... I think we really need this in the world. We need a different lens to see what we what we're doing, what our normal is, because otherwise it's just invisible to us. So yeah. it's really a pleasure. Important. One thing I recommend to people is just come up with some exercises. Like one of the little exercises I did to change myself is for a week I couldn't use utensils. Whether I was at a restaurant or someone's party, for a week Ooh. I could only eat with my hands, no matter what it was. Talk about getting outside of the social stigmas or worrying what people think. Another thing I did is I started a dumpster dive. I could only eat food from the garbage. Um, I did uh, Wisconsin to New York on a bike, 100% eating food from dumpsters. <laughs> Talk about you know changing your, your mentality and dropping the social stigma. Mm. Walking around New York City covered in trash for a month with my project Trash Me. That one's extreme, but going barefoot for a, for a day or walking down the street in a shirt that you really don't like where you feel super uncomfortable, something basic like that. <laughs> do these things to get yourself outside of your comfort zone and the more and more you can, you can do things where you have to worry what people think but you have to get over it, the more you can start to just fully be yourself. And you know, we're talking about sustainability and foraging and all that, but really like, I think one of the most powerful things we can all do is just be ourselves and if we could all just be ourselves I think that would solve so much oh my gosh <laughs> of our problems our, yeah what would that would free up in the human potential well we love you all very much <laughs> thank you Rob. thank you and uh, you <laughs> yeah and uh, he's starting his year-long hundred percent project oh good luck with yeah, that I'll be following you. along it's gonna be it's gonna be an adventure that's all I'm going to say. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And I love the 10% each month. Oh. I never thought of that way. That's really great. Yeah, that was all Rebecca trying to be yeah. more reasonable. And I think that's a good idea. Nice work, Rebecca. <laughs> nice work, Rebecca. I'm sure you'll watch this. Oh. All right. Love to you all. Thank love you. to you all. <laughs> Share in the comments how Rob has influenced your life. And if you are going to take his suggestion and create an exercise or more for yourself. Tell us in the comments what your exercise is, how long you're gonna do it for, and what you're gonna do. Make it fun and make it challenging, some paradigm of yours. Be really fun to hear what you're gonna do in the comments.